Well, let's get more now on the Voice to Parliament referendum. Here's election analyst Anthony Green. Well, the result is in and the voice referendum has been defeated. Overall, the vote is about 60% no, 40% yes. Six states, all six have voted no. The Australian national vote is no, Northern Territory no, and the ACT, the Australian Capital Territory, the only place that has voted yes. Overall, that's a defeat for the referendum. There's been patterns across the country. The Teal seats voted yes. Inner city seats voted yes. Uh, some inner city Liberal seats voted yes, as did Labor seats in the regional areas in the country. The solid of no vote. Where this leaves Indigenous affairs and the debate over representation and welfare is a matter that will continue for the future. But the attempt to change the constitution to insert the voice and recognise Indigenous Australians has been rejected. Anthony Green there. Now for a look at what else is making headlines in Australia's newspapers and online this morning. We are joined again in the studio. Oh, well, first, let's have a look at some of the things that are making news. Uh, the Age is reporting on how residents in the small Victorian town of Rochester are coping. One year on from devastating floods. Uh, many are battling depression and still living in caravans. Mm. The Guardian is reporting on parking spaces in Australia. They may become, well, they may soon become bigger in response to the country's love affair with SUVs and large cars. Hmm. The Financial Review is reporting how cryptocurrency is forcing banks and funds towards new digital asset markets. And the Sydney Morning Herald has a story about the impact of a council's move to overhaul bin night by reducing the collection of general waste to once a fortnight. Not sure how I feel about that. No, My no bin's thanks. stinky enough after I think one I'm pretty week. good at recycling, but yeah. once yeah. a week. No, no All way. right, well, let's take a look at how the papers are covering the voice referendum results. And referendum correspondent Dan Borsha joins us again in the studio. Thanks for sticking around. I know it's been a very busy and hectic, not, no, just, twen not just 24 hours, but months. Nowhere, right? nowhere I'd rather be. Yeah, yeah, right, OK. Than with you both in our audience. And you oh, say that with oh, a right. smile. That's why we adore <laughs> you. It's the truth. It's the truth. Um, let's look at this article that ABC Digital has got. The headline is, Indigenous Australians look to the future after the voice referendum defeat. We know that there is a week of mourning for many First Nations individuals, but after that, what does the future look like? Does it involve hope? Yeah, I think that's the question so many Australians will be waking up to grappling with and considering this morning. Uh, our reporters Carly Williams, Erin Park, Mariam Farr and Andrea Mays have looked into this and spoken to members of the community, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community in parts of the country to find out, right, what is their sense of what is the, the way forward? Because clearly from the results, Australia sent a resounding message that it did not want that model. Uh, and so what, what next? We know that the Prime Minister has said that it won't be a legislative model. We know that Peter Dutton in the past has said that there could be a second referendum on constitutional recognition alone and then a separate legislated voice to parliament model predominantly focusing on local and regional voices. So this is really getting a sense from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But of course it is important to note, as you just have, that there is this week of mourning that an, a number of uh, very high-profile Indigenous leaders have put a black uh, tile on their social media uh, and that there have been calls for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags to be lowered to half-mast acro mast across the country. Let's go to your second story, Dan. Uh, it's in The Australian. It's an uh, opinion piece, I think, by Dennis Shanahan. Anthony Albanese's voice speech, result speech, was magnificent, but came far too late. Could it have all been turned around by just delivering a speech slightly earlier? Well, it's um, implausible. <laughs> it's a really interesting take, I thought, from uh, Dennis Shanahan from The Australian. You're right, saying it's a magnificent speech, saying that it should have been delivered uh, earlier, perhaps in Parliament, that it would have been the type of thing that had a, a resounding impact on the campaign uh, that followed. What I found particularly interesting about this was that interpretation of the Prime Minister's speech compared to that from the opposition leader last night uh, that said that there was a level of arrogance in it and uh, Mr Dutton added, hear the words, quote, hear the words almost of contempt for the Australian people dripping from what he is saying. And I just thought the contrast in two interpretations of, of that same speech was quite interesting. And, and of course, those speeches, as we've heard said this morning and last night from the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, the opposition leader, Peter Dutton, will be very important in framing the next steps. What is the conversation going to be? Uh, and how do we actually now deal with what we know are the very intractable challenges that some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people face? 
Uh, and we've seen campaigners from all sides, politicians from all, of all stripes saying the status quo is not working. So they clearly disagree, they agree rather on the challenge. Mm. They disagree on what the solution is. Now they're going to have to find a way to navigate this together, I suspect. In a week of Parliament, they have to discuss all yeah, this. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. I was thinking it sits tomorrow, as you mentioned before, Dan, and language is going to be critical as well from what we My hear. My word, it will be. From um, our leaders. Uh, now, the last story that you chose is a story out of The Guardian, and it's looking at how prominent Australians have reacted to the referendum result, and it really is quite a, a large scale of yeah. responses. Yeah, and, and a whole range of views. And I thought this one was particularly important because in a debate that has been about the voice I think we can't ever do go wrong by listening to more voices. Uh, this leads with uh, Marcia Langton. It'll be at least two generations before Australians are capable of putting their colonial hatred behind them and acknowledging that we exist. Mm. Uh, Jacinta Napajimpa Price, uh, the, the li Liberal Senator, the Country Liberal Party Senator, Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians. Going forward, we need to prioritise where our most marginalised are. As I've always said, the gap doesn't exist between Indigenous Australians and non-Indigenous Australians. It exists between our most marginalised uh, and and whose first language isn't English. Tanya Hosh, we haven't. We actually have to stand strong, and it might take some time to find the strength and the sets of words that we need to bring. Lydia Thorpe, an independent senator, saying, "I'm not surprised, given the country has not been taken on a journey, and the referendum ultimately was a bad idea in the first place." And Nungai Warren Mundine, who I understand you're going to be speaking with uh, in just a moment, I thought it was important to, to uh, bring one of his quotes in uh, that we're focusing on tomorrow. Uh, Mr Mundine said, we've got to reach out to the Yes campaign, we've got to reach out to those Australians who didn't vote for us and come together because we've got to fix these issues once and for all, which really goes to that point that I was making, mm -hmm. that throughout this campaign there have been so many conversations that have been having. Of course, none of those could fit onto the ballot paper. That was a very clear discussion about a very clear question but what it rose arose was a whole lot of other conversations about what it means to be an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person in Australia right now and even more broadly what it means to be an Australian and these are these are big questions that we are all going to be having to grapple with truth telling I think is going to be at the core of the answers that we seek to find. Well, it was a perfect segue. Thank you, Dan, for coming in and uh, speaking to us this morning. Because uh, for more on the referendum result, we do have prominent no campaigner Warren Mundine joining us live from Brisbane. Warren, good morning. Thank you for your time. Yeah, good morning. Uh, you said you wouldn't celebrate this result. You said it a few times. But how did it make you feel to see the votes come in last night and to see that more than 60 Australians did vote no? It was a, a weird feeling, really. Uh, it's not like your normal campaign, you know, an election campaign. This is about the heart and soul of this nation and, and how we're going to be moving forward. So it was just like a calming effect on me. I just sort of sat there and I was very pleased that, you know, the 12 months of hard work that we did, you know, and, and, and it was really tough to do it. Uh, and, uh, and the Australian people, uh, you know, uh, rewarded us for that. Uh, Why do you so. think you won? Why do you think the No Campaign won? Oh, well, there's a several things. The first thing was the mistake of uh, uh, people having learned from history about referendums. Referendums have to have a bipartisan approach, whether you like it or not. Uh, you have to reach out to the other side and you have to have a conversation with them and come together on, on supporting that. Uh, so that was the first mistake that they did. Uh, and then the, the second mistake was that when it became very obvious, because through the polling and everything, that uh, people wanted more detail about it, they, sh they, they should, I would have, if I was in their campaign, I would have changed, I would have changed track and actually gave some detail and talked about that. Uh, but so, so that these are the things mm. that come. There's a lot of Australians who would have wanted, who I do know, who wanted to vote yes, but voted no because of those two things. All right. Uh, you said a few times throughout the campaign mm. you'd wanted to defeat this proposition and that the hard work was going to begin on Sunday morning. So what hard work's beginning today? Well, for me at the moment is uh, doing these interviews and that, but then we'll have conversations with the team and that. And, because, and look, there's going to be, uh, you know, the, there's a call for a week of, you know, reflection and, mm. and, and silence and that. Uh, we will respect that. Uh, I think that because I've been in the positions where we've, we've lost things and where you put your heart and soul into it and, uh, and, it's, and it's tough 
when you when you don't come out with that victory. So right. we'll respect that, and we will we'll, uh, uh, you know then we'll sit down and have those conversations. Can we just go into some of the detail though? I know it is still very fresh, but do you still plan to push for the development of treaties or a national treaty, like you suggested on insiders? Will you help the coalition develop maybe a private members bill for regional or local voices to set up some of the things you did discuss in the campaign? Well, the things that are, are, are discussed is that I don't I don't support. Uh, a, a national treaty. I don't support that at all. Uh, I've never supported that and it's all through my writings and everything like that. Mm. I didn't support the, the, the way that the uh, Yes campaign were going to take this down. I, I didn't support the Makarata Commission and that. Uh, we have our people, we have our traditional owners, our clan leaders and our elders in our communities of our all the many Aboriginal f nations across this country. They're the voices for our people. Our culture tells us we can't talk for someone else's country except, uh, you know, uh, and, and they can't talk for us. And so sure. that's why it's got to be. A local treaties. So you're not going to start work towards local treaties like you suggested a few weeks back? Uh, my first thing is that to, to actually, you know, and I put up the four pillars that I think needs to go forward. The first one is about, you know, this accountability. How do we, how do we, and it's not about blaming or attacking people. It's about, okay, look, we've been spending billions of dollars every year. What, what has worked and what hasn't worked? And really do a surgical approach to that about performance. How can we perform better? Because there are some programs that have done some good work. There are other programs that have, have gone backwards in that. Mm. So we've got to really focus on about how we're spending our money and getting those outcomes that we need, uh, working with those, uh, working with the people on the ground. Okay. The other ones of education is so important. We need them work with families, work with parents and work with communities to get that kids to school and working. Yeah. Is there a risk, do you think, Warren, that uh, politicians might look at this result and say 60% or more of Australians have voted no and think this is too hard, treaties are too hard, closing the gap's too hard, and they sort of push this issue to one side like they have in the past because there aren't heaps and heaps of votes in Indigenous affairs? Well, I don't think they li were listening during the campaign. You know, During the campaign, uh, the Australian people on all sides, the Australian people want... Aboriginal people to live a prosperous, long life and be and be part of the Australian community together. <coughs> Excuse me. And and that was clear from everyone I spoke to. There were yes voters or no voters. Now they 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 they're sick and tired of the problems that Aboriginal people are suffering under, the struggles that they're suffering under. And so we've so if if politicians want to go down that end then they're wasting their time. We've got to really focus and work together to resolve the, uh, Aboriginal peoples who are struggling out there and fix it. All right, finally, Warren, I did want to ask, mm. you spent a bit of time with Peter Dutton through this campaign. Do you think he, and, and probably more importantly, do you think the coalition is serious about closing the gap and serious about achieving reconciliation in this country? Well, they're, they're very much serious about it. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why they took the stance. And it was one of the reasons why they had that, that uh, Peter Dutton sent that letter to the Prime Minister about, the, the, you know, could you answer these questions? Because we're, we're very serious about this approach. We All Australians are. And we really want to work and make it happen. And, and of course, uh, Peter Dutton's is out there and, and, and seriously pushing this line. Uh, look, the Prime Minister of Australia, it's really, a, he's, he's the leader of this country. He's our Prime Minister for all Australians. He needs to now sit down, uh, change some of his rhetoric and also to uh, now to reunite, reunite the country and move mm. forward. All right, Warren, we are out of time. We do appreciate you coming in and uh, having a chat with us, though, after what has been a long campaign. Thank you very much. Well, for many Australians, particularly Indigenous Australians, the referendum debate has been challenging and taken a toll on their mental health. The debate uh, shone an intense spotlight on Australia's relationship with its First Nations people and uh, some Indigenous people are very likely to be hurting this morning after, as we just heard, the Yes campaign was defeated in every state and the Northern Territory as well. To discuss how people can look after their mental health at this time, we are joined by Clinton Schultz from the Black Dog Institute. Good morning. Thanks Good morning. for coming in. No worries, Bill. What's, what's, I mean, people are going to be struggling this morning. What, what should they do? Is it switching off? I think the first thing people need to do is take some time to just reflect on, on what has happened, not just yesterday, but across the entire period of the campaign. Um, 
I think what's been likely to be experienced by many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today is an experience of rejection and that rejection coming at a societal level. And, and so I think we need to process the same way that we go about processing other forms of rejection mm -hmm. so that it doesn't run away from us and I guess form what is known in in psych spaces is rejection trauma. Right. Mm. Rejection is one part of it, I guess, but as we've heard both this morning and the weeks leading up to this and throughout this campaign, the months of racism, trauma, and the expectations of First Nations people to educate others on the voice as, as well, what sort of toll has that taken and what health supports are there for those people who are struggling? Yeah, I can't lie, it's, it's taken a significant toll on many people within our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. I think that that cultural load that you were just mentioning is something that before this referendum process many people weren't necessarily aware of was problematic within the workplaces mm. that our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples are in. I don't think we can hide that anymore. You know, I think most Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were expected to be experts throughout this entire campaign and to, to share their thoughts, their emotions, their experiences and that can be really tolling when you have to do that day on day on it. And then to just have the entire national spotlight on you and focused wholly and solely what it feels like on you and your family and your community can be quite challenging and overwhelming. So there has been a lot of increase in psychological distress that's being experienced. Does uh, the fact it's involved in politics as well, particularly federal politics, and became such a, you know, a, a polarised issue at a political level, does that make it a lot worse because it's not just a, a discussion within the society look become like a debating point yeah. almost <laughs> personally i think you know if if i could have seen anything changed i would have loved to have seen this not be politicized mm. uh it is you're correct you know whenever we see our affairs once again being uh put in that space of a political football mm. that it it often gets talked about that's a really uncomfortable thing for us as aboriginal and torres strait islander peoples because it's dehumanizing mm. so it takes away the fact that not only are we aboriginal and torres strait islander peoples first nations peoples in this country we're actually human beings and i think at times people forget and they don't allow themselves to process this situation at that human level mm. We know that um, in the May budget there was some money set aside for projects to boost mental health support for First Nations people. What is there and what more might be needed? Yeah, we were really grateful to see that money flow through and that money went through to the National Aboriginal um, Community Controlled Health Sector and it went out to all their individual services to help bolster, I guess, the social emotional wellbeing workforce available Honestly, it's not going to be enough. It wasn't enough before, and I don't think it's going to be enough now that we've seen the levels of psychological distress that have been increased for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So I think we're going to have to see far more investment in the space of social and emotional wellbeing so we don't see continued issues coming out of this. Uh, Clinton Schultz from the Black Dog Institute, thank you so much for coming in to Pleasure. have this important chat. Thank this you. Morning. Thank you.